we will now move on to our 6.5 6 item. 10.30 a.m. A, consideration of presentation of the summary of hitch spawning 2023 from the Lake County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee. B, consideration of Lake County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee's recommendation to approve $5,400 to support the Robinson Rancheria and California Department of Fish and Wildlife Program to eradicate carp from Clear Lake. And we have our Agriculture Commission and we have our committee members. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to this presentation. I know a lot has happened to get us to this point. So I will pass it over to you. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for having us. I'm Greg Giusti, Chair of the Lake County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee. Uh, Luis Santana, Vice Chair. And um, that was an understatement. Since your emergency declaration, a lot has been put into motion about the hitch. And uh, this committee has, has taken to heart uh, the direction that we've been given. And uh, so this is our chance to provide a summary of what uh, committee members have found and to highlight some of the other activities that uh, are ongoing in the county um, outside of, of this particular committee. What a difference a year makes. The, the weather conditions this last winter and spring provided optimal spawning conditions for fish. Um, after so many years of, of drought and dry creeks, water being in, the, being in the streams at the first of the year, and more importantly, sustained flows through May, and, and even today, Kelsey Creek and Middle Creek still have water in them. We haven't seen that in a long time. So it not only provided the opportunity for adults to come upstream and spawn, it provided an opportunity for the eggs to be laid, to incubate, to hatch, and for the juveniles to move back down through the system and, and get to the, back to the lake and find the refugia that they find in the tules and other um, uh, shoreline vegetation. Equally important is the lake came up nine and a half to 10 feet because of all these rains. A year ago, the water was 100 yards in some places from Thule's. Now, when the, when the lake filled up, those juvenile fish that were able to move down the creeks, and even those that are born in the lake, are able to move into the cover of the Thule's and find protection from, from predation. So, in terms of recruitment, we probably couldn't have asked for a more optimal year for recruitment for Hitch uh, to get new individuals into the, into the system. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Luis in a little bit, and he can talk about some of the activities of, of all three tribal act, uh, members that, that are on the committee. Uh, but just to, to give you a quick overview of boots on the ground and committee members putting eyes on fish, fish were recorded in Adobe, Alley, Clover, Bachelor, Cole, Cooper, Dale, Lyons, Forbes, Kelsey, Thompson, Middle, Scotts, and Robinson Creeks. So all of the creeks that historically supported fish, and this is just a short list, there could be others, um, creeks that historically supported hitch runs because of the water conditions saw, uh, saw fish return this year. I mean, it, it really is a testament to the resilience of these, these little fish. I mean, they've had a lot thrown at them, the drought years most likely inhibited their ability to, to get recruits into the population and we saw multiple age and, st and size classes come back into the creeks. Uh, Luis and members of the Robinson, the Big Valley, and the Habe Matol uh, tribes participated in a number of fish rescues. Because of the high flows, many fish got out of the boundaries of creeks and were trapped in, in puddles. Uh, and I know uh, Luis has got some numbers he'll share with you. So there was a a big effort to make sure that fish that got out of the creeks were picked up and put back into the creeks and uh, get enough practice to get real good at it. And the survivability of those fish was extremely high. I would say, you know, better than 98%. Other groups, because of your, um, uh, because of the board's action to declare the emergency situation, you know, other, other groups that have been looking at uh, Hitch in in the broad sense, not only the blue the blue ribbon committee, uh, our our wildlife committee, but the agricultural committee, the Clear Lake Conservation Strategy, the Clear Lake Hitch Task Force, 
and the Big Valley Groundwater Sustainability Program, everybody has focused their, their attention and, and uh, are now considering the hitch in their, in their discussions. Um, it, really, it really is a, it's a testament to, to the leadership that this board showed in, in getting people to wake them up and say, all right, we have to start paying attention to these little fish. And I, I think the community has responded. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Luis now, give him a few minutes, and then I'll, I'll finish up with some other uh, future activities that we, we know are going on. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll be able to talk about uh, some of the rescues. So it, it's kind of broken down into uh, two basins, Big Valley and Middle Creek watershed. There, there has been some stuff on uh, the lower lake side of the lake on Siegler Creek, but not as much. Um, so Big Valley, uh, most of the, so these numbers uh, actually come from um, larval and fry rescues, not adults. The adults I had already reported um, as of May, so I'm just updating uh, numbers since May. So in Big Valley, there was um, 21,939 uh, larvae and fry that were rescued. Uh, and then in Middle Creek, we actually just started doing rescues because we had been waiting for the creeks to recede enough to justify a rescue event. Um, in Middle Creek itself and in Scotts Creek, there's actually still water that's supporting hitch and other native species. So we kind of just waited. Um, and if there needed to be a rescue, we would go in and, and do the rescue. But in Middle Creek, this is all also juveniles um, and fry. And we've rescued um 2848 in the last month or so and so th this is obviously awesome to be able to do um and we can't really say okay we say these fish and they're gonna you know survive to adulthood because these are at the bottom of the food chain so they do get eaten but uh, they have a better chance now that they have been able to survive but on middle creek I th last week we did a habitat assessment and there's still a lot of intact habitat. So it's looking good there. And even on Scotts Creek, um, that was really surprising because there's areas where last year there was no water starting in like July. And now there's like, there's plenty of water and I'm not too worried about those fish uh, moving forward. Um, and then part of our observations. Oh, I gave you the observation numbers, sorry. So the rescue numbers were actually 985 uh, Clear Lake Hitch and others as well, but uh, we were just focused on Clear Lake Hitch and the observations were 2,848 and that was, um, oh, actually that's juveniles, 2,848 juveniles seen in some of these creeks during um, spawning time and they didn't, they weren't spawning, they were congregating with other fishes, which is really um, interesting because I had never seen that before, but there was 760 adults and the the weird thing about Middle Creek and Scotts Creek is anytime we were out at the same time, uh, Big Valley was out doing their spawner surveys, we couldn't see any fish because the creeks were so turbid. So just because we saw um, very little adults doesn't mean they weren't there. Because then after the spawn, it was, it was kind of like this three-day window um, that we saw some fish and then we didn't see them again. And then we started seeing eggs and larval fishes emerge. So just because we didn't see any doesn't mean they were there, but it, overall it was a good spawning year. Um, hopefully a lot of those fish have made it back to the lake, and if not, you know, some are surviving. When we do do rescues, we do end up finding um, dead fry, dead larval fishes, so it does happen. Um, one of our rescue events on Lions Creek, uh, most of the fish that we were actually able to scoop out were just like floating on the water already. So sometimes, you know, it happens. It sucks, but it does happen. That's, a, that's all I have for Hitch. Yeah, thank you, Luis. So, you know, Luis is a fisheries biologist for the Robinson Rancheria, so he's one of, the, one of the guys that's got boots on the ground. And I'm gonna stick my neck out a little bit here today and you know, say fish need water. And that was, that's what made the difference this year. I mean, we, we had water for a prolonged period of time. We had flows that allowed fish to move upstream. They were able to get up as far as the stream allowed them. You know, and, and there are obstacles, there are culverts, there are bridge abutments, there are things that stop fish from moving up. But those reaches of, fi those reaches of streams that fish could reach, they, they had the ability to get in there and, and do their thing and turn around and go back. And uh, 
it really was it really was heartwarming to see see so many fish uh, come up the streams again. You know, that's someone who's who's uh, followed them for over 20 years. It, it's been a while. And even Fish and Game said these are the best numbers they'd seen since 2014. Just again, you know, our, our committee is, is more or less just a, cl a clearinghouse and a gathering of, of other information. We're volunteers, um, and uh, you asked us to, to take on this chore, and people have responded. As you heard, Luis, they've responded quite, quite boldly. But other things that have been shared with us going on within the Watershed Protection District, um, well, I, myself and members of your staff uh, talked directly with Kelseyville uh, Unified School District and asked them to hold back their sport field irrigation uh, for a couple of weeks well into May because they have big pumps and those big pumps are next to Cold Creek and Cold Creek had a lot of fish this year and we worked with them, they were very agreeable. They held off you know, watering, irrigating their, their sports fields to ensure that they didn't dewater the, the streams. Uh, there's the, uh, uh, the tribes are working on a tagging pro, uh, pro project with Cal Fish and Wildlife. Um, could the, uh, the watershed district is contributing to the state's Hitch Task Force meeting and contributing to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conservation strategy meetings. Uh, grants and awards that the district has uh, sought, $500,000 applied and submitted for the beneficial to hitch to Congress and Mike Thompson for Adobe, uh, Adobe Creek conjunctive use, Kelsey Creek detention structure repair, Scotts Valley project looking at groundwater. Um, other US EPA awards of $399,000 with establishing habitat assessments on hitch observation network. So there's a lot going on right now uh, with different groups well beyond our small little committee that are paying attention to Hitch. So, you know, it's, things just look a lot better this year than they have for a long time. And we hope that with the added attention that your action has brought uh, to the Hitch, you know, we, we will continue to see positive progression in, uh, in maintaining this unique Lake County species. Thank you for your report. Are you, um, are you aware of any of the work that Triple C volunteers are doing for creek cleanup in or, Col I'm, I didn't hear Oh, you. the California, um, Angela, maybe you can answer a question on that later. Yeah. C's, three C's, okay. Yeah. I'm not, but I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who can. Okay, I was just hoping we could get a little report on that. If you wanna go right now, that'd be great. I don't have exact numbers, but they were out a couple weeks ago and they removed a lot of vegetation from um, creeks in uh, uh, Adobe Creek and tributaries in the Big Valley area. So um, that's successful. I know that was run by CDFW, Jennifer Garcia there, um, with partnership from the Watershed Protection District, some staff, uh, Marina and Mitchell worked a lot on that project and they um, got some good results. And so they're hoping to do similar work within the Big Valley and other basins. Um, basically clearing out a lot of veg invasives um, and, and natives that were, were clogging the channels. Okay, and do you know if they hit Coal Creek? That was one of the places yeah, they were. Yeah, some areas in there, yes. Okay, great, thank you. They did Coal, McGaw, Adobe, <laughs> and some, somewhere Thompson? else. Uh, uh, I don't think Thompson, they're gonna come back in the next six weeks to do Big Valley again and then do part of Middle Creek Watershed. Awesome, great, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Green. Yeah, thank you very thank you very much for this report. A uh, little committee that roars, uh, in my estimation, and I hope you will continue to uh, uh, meet and uh, educate us. Um, uh, one thing that I found fascinating: the anecdotal reports and the videos and the, all that. We have a really good uh, understanding that this was definitely a significant year. Um, but in terms of how we map that and how we do resource planning for future years, uh, it's kind of a side concern, but it is a concern. How do we document through this combination of scientific study and this anecdotal evidence where our hitch habitat is? And it may be actually a larger question, where are our public trust waters um, that the hitch run in? Uh, and how do we map that? And, and in some instances, um, especially in projects coming uh, before community development, um, some of those projects do have to take a look at uh, hitch habitat, at least that was recorded in prior years. And uh, my inkling uh, is that some of the resources out there that may be uh, referenced by biologists 
analysts in preparing reports for these projects may be outdated or inaccurate based on what we've learned this year. So uh, can you explain uh, to the extent you have knowledge of this, what, what traditional resource documents are out there that do define and establish the outer limits of, of what hitch habitat is, and has this year's strong spawning run um, kind of changed that dynamic? Do, do we in fact have outdated resource materials that need to be updated, and if so, what is that process? Well, all, publish all public and published resource materials are in the past, right? So they're, they're, all, they're automatically dated. Uh, what's needed is real-time collection and a repository of everybody's efforts monitoring fish and being able to have real-time assessment of what the population is doing. You know, I, I was able, we were able to put together uh, this report today based on what people were willing to share, but that's literally picking up the phone saying, what have you got? It would be nice if we could establish a system that people were comfortable with where they could report their, their findings, time, water temperature, uh, flow rates, and for example, U.S. Geological Survey put, on, put up a new stream gauge this year on Coal Creek. So when I recorded the finding of hitch on Coal Creek, I not only was able to say, yes, there's fish and give an estimate of numbers, I was able to provide flow rates and temperatures of that water. And I submitted that that information to CLERC, the Clear Lake uh, uh, what, Education and Research. Environmental Research Center. Them, those guys. So, uh, and they, they have, they have a, a way to, to record that, but then in talking with, with them, they don't have the funds to actually do anything with that data. So, it, but that's the kind of repository that would provide real-time information year after year so that we could start to do a trend analysis. Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of efforts of sampling out in the lake, but whether one group, one agency is using gill nets, another, another uh, agency is using electrofishing, that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Okay, it's a big lake, and these are small fish. The best way to count these fish is when they're in the streams. It's just like counting salmon. You don't count them in the ocean, you count them when they're in the rivers, coming through a, a weir or something like that. So that... If we could establish a system that all of the participants were comfortable in and get that real-time information, then we could start to do some trend analysis and understand the relationship between flows, temperatures, water quality, and how these fish respond. That's a, that's a big gap right now. How do we get real-time data, collect it, and analyze it so, so people can make decisions from it? Well, I th two, two things at least, population modeling, and there is a huge data gap in that, but also for our selfish purposes in analyzing potential uh, uh, projects, we can't really adequately define clearly catch habitat right now. So if, a, again, a biologist is tasked with saying, is this project with an X amount of uh, documented hitch habitat, unless they turn around and say, oh, it was a good rain season, now I've got to go reach out to Clerk or some other uh, data source to pu pull that together themselves. It puts them at a disadvantage. So, um, you know, they're going to pull whatever available information is out there, and it does tend to be outdated. So definitely not something we're going to put on the committee's to-do list, but as the state and federal agencies and our local uh, stakeholders continue to track this data, you're right, we need to report it in some type of portal, and we need to make it actionable, uh, among other things, so we can do seeker review of uh, pending projects. So just wanted to share that. No, thank you. Well, I mean, I think this is a discussion that could happen at this committee of figuring out how as all the partners are at the table and stakeholders are at the table, how can we develop some kind of local tracking system that everybody is comfortable sharing with? Well, Has we that been could, a, We could certainly ask, you know, we could certainly put that on the agenda for discussion and, and there's a lot of talented people on that committee and see what, what we can come up with. And, and then maybe that's something that we can fund if it comes back as a request is, you know, figure out what everybody, I'm just gonna look for a consensus here to figure out what everybody, how, how everyone can agree to do this and feels comfortable going forward and then what that looks like and then how do we build that out? And how can we can support that from the board level? Okay. Supervisor Green, uh, did you mean like a spatial analysis kind of thing? Like when we go in, do whatever rescues or do any habitat and just report on a spatial analysis? Like, so you could see it on a map, like, oh, this is here, this is here, this is here. 
I'm going to use I'm going to use the exact you know if say for example a cannabis project was popping up near a stream where a hitch habitat could be present or not you know the argument is how far up are they and I um, don't want to put a particular applicant under the spot but I'm aware of one project that claims the closest hitch habitat is you know over a mile away maybe at the time the survey was done that was true but knowing where this particular site is and knowing where the hitch ran uh, to the best of my knowledge they pushed all the way up to the, uh, the the dams for the reservoir and possibly even beyond magically so i'm not really sure what's happening with the hitch upstream of highland springs i'm curious about that uh, but I think the closest thing that would be deliverable would be to follow a example that Sonoma County has used. Permit Sonoma ended up passing a public trust ordinance that maps out um, uh, basically where fish roam uh, in their jurisdiction. And it's kind of a hodgepodge of uh, primary agricultural areas and the tributaries, right? And it's a public trust ordinance because it follows what CDFW and the Fish and Game Code define as navigable waters where, you know, fish are known to run. And, and at the end of that, they have a whole bunch of regulations. And if you're in a public trust area, you have to do certain things as far as uh, well permits and what have you. But the deliverable that would be most useful, I think, and I don't want to speak for anyone from CDD, would be a map. And part of what Permit Sonoma's uh, uh, public trust ordinance does is has a very detailed GIS-capable uh, map that maps out all the, all the areas where those additional well regulations uh, are, are done. And it but it follows, it's a subset of the county as a whole. They focus their efforts in these public trust areas where the fish are, and they map those areas. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, Sonoma County. Wildlife has done it for coho salmon in Sonoma. So, I mean, you can actually, as you say, look on a GIS layer, look at the name of the creek and see where fish, uh, those coho salmon in that case, uh, are, are known to have occurred. So, yeah, I, it's doable. Um, and, it, it would, and I agree, it would be a very useful tool for, for planning purposes and for decision makers. And there may be some GIS data that would help cobble together a crude uh, effort of that, you know, that has a, a WW overlay zone or something like that. So there may be some crude tools that we could cobble together to at least estimate. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I support the suggestion by Chair Paiska that if it's something you could kind of kick the tires on and get back to us on what is feasible, what can be done, it would certainly help hitch recovery efforts that are ongoing, but it would also help us uh, in other areas of the county's work uh, involving uh, land use planning and project approval. I should have something like that in the next couple of months. I just have to go through my data. I just haven't had time. Sure, and then what, what we would also, I think like to see is the just the shared data and how can we get to a point where we're all sharing data and seeing collective data across the county and that would and be huge figuring out how we get there yes ma'am I can't get my pen, okay. but I'm trying. Supervisor Spontier. Um, I think that if we can prove that locally we can share amongst each other, that we can invite other federal and state partners to do the same. Uh, I think if we can make it happen here, uh, then it's it, we can start growing even further than what uh, just our data. We can involve other people's data as well. Um, so I, that, I would agree with that to move forward. I think the mapping is an interesting idea. I don't know how its impacts will be used, and I think that's another discussion altogether as far as how it impacts development or how it imp impacts projects. Uh, but having a map at least gives us data to be able to rely on and see what is happening. So uh, I'm in favor of looking at both those things, and if the committee can find, maybe by speaking with Sonoma County, if that's the idea that uh, you want to move forward with, uh, or finding out what is the best practice out there for uh, dealing with this and uh, coming back to us and letting us know uh, if there's a price tag that's attached to it. Yeah, good point. Supervisor Crandall? No, I want to apologize for uh, jumping out to uh, VA calls when they want to from different agencies. I'm just glad I don't have to go to the appointment. But nonetheless, I just I might have missed part of the presentation, so this question you probably already answered, but I'll ask it again. Um, Glad to see that the waters help, you know, for the for the uh, chai to survive. Do you think they it, it would have enhanced even more had the sedi sediment and the vegetation been dealt with as well? Yeah, uh, sediment and vegetation. It's it's more of a management practice now. Um, 
in appropriate areas like where to deal with um, excess sediment or excess vegetation, yeah, absolutely. Especially when it comes to uh, migration upstream and downstream. Uh, that's one thing we're definitely looking at. I'm, and I'm speaking on behalf of Robinson's program. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, absolutely. There, there are areas where uh, sediment and vegetation is a huge problem and we're trying to, like that's part of the C's work, the three, um, California Conservation Corps, but we're also working on separate projects just like that. Like on Scott's Creek, there's so much woody debris throughout that creek, it's insane. Right. Um, there's places that are blocked off. And in, in some instances is actually good for out migrating juveniles because it, you know, it causes pools and then the water just kind of stays there and there's plenty of shade. Um, but as far as migration, yeah, that's definitely a problem um, in areas where they're blocking the entire creek. Do, do you think also with uh, like what we're talking about with the, the data or the mapping or whatever the case may be, um, highlighting the areas with that uh, sediment and vegetation being an obstacle could also be included or is that is that a lot more? No, I'm, I'm working on that too. Okay. I just haven't been able to go through my data. It's, thank it's you. a lot. <laughs> so we're mapping the problem areas? Yeah, 100%. Right. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Anything else? Okay, no. I'll open it up for the public. We have anyone in the chambers that would like to come up. You can state your name. Um, I, but your staff, so I think, <laughs> yeah. Um, Ansel Pomadell, Lake County Water Resources. One project I wanted to add was that CDFW is actually dedicated, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, another staff member. His name is Nathan, and they are contributing to what's called a flow study. So they are actually identifying areas for flow where habitat is being utilized by hitch. Um, so they're going to be generating a lot of information. They're using what's called green LIDAR. Um, there's also the effort from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to collect all of this data and information that we're talking about today um, in order to make the listing decision that's coming down in 2025. Um, I just think it's uh, prudent to recognize all the efforts that are going on from the state and federal level. So here at our resource-constrained county level, we're not you know, reinventing um, tools that may or may not work that are already be developed that are already being developed concurrently with a lot more staff and resources. So those are some things that are going on. Um, and then um, I did want to share a item, and Matthew has it; he can share it. So a uh, part about data sharing: we are hosting a Clear Lake Integrated Science Symposium. So the last time Clear Lake had a science symposium was in 97, 98. I have the hard copy uh, symposium proceedings upstairs. They got a nice layer of dust on them. Um, so this is a place where we want to have information sharing um, be accessible to the public, to agencies, to partners. Um, we do have a couple pre-symposium um, work groups. So instead of us getting a huge big committee to decide on how to do the symposium, we're gonna have a couple work groups. Um, thank you to the board. You guys approved a contract with Dr. Janine Pfeiffer um, to help organize the symposium. We've gotten some grant funds from the Integrated West Side um, SAC Integrated Regional Water Management Group. We've also got sponsorship funds from the Yolo County Flood Protection Water Conservation District. The district is also matching some funds, um, and we are going to be reaching out and doing more fundraising um, for this to, to have a place to host it. It will be in August of 2024, so it's about a year away, um, and this gets us, gives us a lot of time to plan. We're going to have researchers present agencies, state, federal, tribal, um, as well as um, many different sessions. We are going to be going to the Fish and Wildlife Committee to ask to sponsor the Hitch session, which might be a day, um, but that's a place where we're going to have all the information um, any information on um, uh, spawning, juvenile surveys, hitch surveys, we'll have fish and wildlife present. U.S. Fish and Wildlife can give updates on the conservation strategy, as well as um, other sessions for basically Clear Lake research and watershed land-based research. So um, we are planning to do a what's called a digital binder for the proceedings for this, as opposed to a dusty binder that goes on the shelf that we don't look at again for another 25 years. We're gonna have this be an interactive website with links, so if people wanna find out more about what UC Davis is doing, what Robinson's doing, they can look at some of that data, they can get links to it. Um, and this is kind of our response to um, issues with Hitch as well as other issues that are going on in Clear Lake, Clear Lake Watershed. Um, I have some hard copies of this flyer I'll put up here and then also provide to the board and admin. Great, thanks Angela. Mm -hmm. So, um, the green LIDAR project, is that um, from flyover data and when's that being collected? 
Um, so they're actually starting it now. And okay. Luis, I don't know if you have more information on green light or Nathan explained it to me in like a quick 10 minutes. Um, but basically they're combining, um, yeah, some aerial and on the ground information okay. to kind of look at flows and habitat and the structure of creeks. Um, because we don't know exactly what habitat hitch prefer, they probably just like anything where there's enough water. <laughs> um, so what they're trying to do is to identify exactly how, if we're gonna restore these streams, how we can do that and where hitch utilizing the streams the most. Um, like Louise said, you can have, you need to have enough flow, but too much flow is gonna prevent um, uh, juveniles from migrating and also adults from migrating up to, to spawn. Okay, so we're doing our countywide LIDAR flyover any minute? 39%. Or 39%. Terry, do you think that this um, information will be useful for the habitat? Do you want to come up and give a, like a little minute on it? <laughs> this is the project that we um, I've been pushing really hard for the last two years, and we got the funding from the Department of Conservation and USGS to do um, full LIDAR of the whole county starting now. Um, the next hurdle is getting this, the, um, about $500,000 for software um, so that it's publicly accessible on that platform. So. Yeah, great. That's a great introduction. Um, um, my name is Terry Logston. I'm the Chief Climate Resiliency Officer and Tribal Liaison for the County of Lake. And uh, Matthew Rostein in our admin office and I had the opportunity a two weeks ago, I believe it was, with the kickoff team about the LIDAR. We're now, as I yelled out from the audience, sorry, was that we're at 39%. Um, but it's not just Lake County. We're part of a a larger swath of the North Coast. It's very high resolution uh, thanks to I believe uh, Supervisor Paiska and others to get us this uh, technology and this product at such a low affordable cost for the county. It's truly amazing. They're going to be rendering it. I think we get the final product in a year, but the flyover is happening and we're constantly seeking funding for the derivatives that will be publicly available where uh, all kinds of companies and particularly uh, our uh, water resources staff and, and the tribes can use for decisions such as this. So yeah. thanks. And looking at watersheds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, staff, for filling in a few things. Um, now I will open it up for the public. If anyone in the chambers would like to come up, um, you can have three minutes. State your name. All right. Hi, I'm Pat Scully. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, basically gathering information, I think, is something that is, we have done a terrible job at. Uh, we do have a means of doing that through the clerk website, which some people have decided that's not a good place because I'm, I'm not sure why, but we should all be real happy what we saw this year. There was a huge hitch run. Uh, we own the property just below the Adobe Creek Reservoir. We've owned it for the last 20 years, and this was by far the biggest hitch run that we've seen up there, and we keep a pretty close close eye on it. Um, we feel that there's been a serious effort to downplay the the great hitch run that we just saw. Um, feel that through the state agencies, um, some of the local, I mean, basically some of the local groups that are monitoring. We we should be just thrilled to death of what we saw this year, and we're not seeing that. I've got drone footage of Adobe Creek that I will share with each of you. I'll, I'll, it's too hard to email, so I'll, I'll give you guys thumb drives with it. It just it shows thousands of fish. Um, ben Ewing with the Fish and Wild or the yeah California Fish and Wildlife. He does his assessments. I think I think he showed his first hitch sighting on April 3rd on the Clerk website, and I know it's just not on the website. We saw it in person. I believe it was March 15th, there were thousands of hitch seen in Coal Creek. So you're 18 days before Ben saw anything in, that was reported. And that's the information that's getting out to the agencies. So if, if that's the information that they're basing their population estimates on, Greg mentioned that the place to look and see the health of the population is in the creeks during the spawn. We need to do a better job of monitoring that and recording that. Um, I would suggest for people that don't like the clerk website or think that anyone can get on there and sabotage it or whatever, that we get that changed to where everyone's got 
iPhones and can take videos. It's pretty hard if you submit a video on one day of fish going up and down the creek that you know, you're told that it actually didn't happen. Um, I know the Big Valley Tribe had a, had a large staff of people that were monitoring uh, you know, throughout the spawning season. And they, were, they were down at the water board hearings prior to the spawn saying, testifying how they haven't seen any hitch yet, but they were hoping to see some. But I don't think there's been any information given, um, supplied by the Big Valley Tribe on what they saw. And they, they've got all the information. Um, agricultural community, I think, was monitoring it fairly closely. I think if you talk to the agriculture, people in the agricultural community that live along these creeks, uh, there's a lot of information there. And there's a lot of information on the clerk website. I'd hope that you guys will take, Thank you, Pat. take a look at it. Um, and by the way, we can't receive thumb drives. <laughs> you what? It's against our policy to receive Oh, you can't drives. use thumb so, drives? Um, maybe we could get it a different way. Um, so we yeah, send it, do drop it off at admin or something. We'll figure out, yeah. yes, great. Right. That'd be great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and then I think just the, we need to figure out how we can get to sharing data. And I, I think the committee and having, you know, kind of working through some of the issues is a great place to start. Great, thank you. Bad. Anyone else in the chambers? Joan, come on up. I want to know, since I took pictures of the hitch also, I have them on file with channel eight. They're six, seven inches long at the hop, at the high end of Dobie Creek. How eradicating the carp, how are you going to eradicate the carp when the hitch are so near them? We're going to get to, that's the next part this of the- This is about the agenda. Yeah, I know. And this is item A and we're going to get to item B in just a minute. And then maybe your questions will be answered. So if you want to talk about carp, come back up in a couple of minutes after we. And secondly, I want to know about the water. Okay. The grand jury has a good paragraph about the water. I'll talk about that when I, when you let me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else in the chambers? Okay, great. I think Joan forgot a book here. Hi, it's Rebecca Harper with Lake County Farm Bureau. I just wanted to highlight um, something else positive that's, that's happening. And I think Angela would probably be be better fit to give some more details. But the Lake County Watershed Protection District in partnership with um, NCR, NRCS has received some funding that will be open to farmers in the community to apply for, um, specifically if they have projects that will impact uh, water quality and, and examples of that could be uh, better, better management practices, fencing for livestock to limit access to waterways, um, improving stream crossings, reducing soil erosion, just some of those practices who, that have the potential to affect water quality and potentially the hitch as well. So that's pretty exciting. There's some funding for that. Um, and we will be working together to host a workshop on that and get folks into apply. So I just wanted to give some attention to that as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the chambers? Okay. Michael, we Michael Wegner, thank you very much, board, for bringing this all forward. Um, I think that we spend a lot of time focused on all the things that are wrong or not going well, and I think this is a point where we can really look at the community working together to, you know, create a solution, um, working in conjunction with every everybody who's sitting at the table, all the shareholders, and um, I just want to highlight the fact that you know traditional ag and the ad hoc committees have been working together very well or very closely. Uh, and with that, I think we can potentially see more advancements on this particular front to making things better and getting more accurate counts. But it's not really a, this side and that side, it's really all of us together. And I think that's how everybody's working. And I think that this meeting today actually highlights that. So I just wanna point out that we as a group are doing well. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else in the chambers? Look to the Zoom room. 
I'm not seeing any hands up in the Zoom room. So then we can move on to, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. I'm gonna see if anyone from the board has anything to add before we move on to item B. Just last thing, I, I appreciate very much the comment uh, about the leadership this board has represented, but we, we follow in the footsteps of giants if it were not for the advocacy of the tribes and their EPAs uh, and the state and federal agencies picking up that mantle, mantle uh, it would not have landed in our laps with such force uh, to demand action by this board. So I appreciate uh, the vote of confidence that we're getting things right. Uh, there may be people who disagree with that from time to time, but I, I, I do appreciate um, the first peoples of this land who instruct us uh, about what good land and water stewardship means. Thank you. And I, I'd like to just thank Mr. Wagner's comments. I mean, the, um, you know, our, our committee, I, I don't run a real tight ship when I run a meeting. I let, I let people talk and, and let people feel comfortable. And, um, and, and that's, that's obvious when we come together. I mean, there may be differences of opinion, but people are free to, sh people feel comfortable uh, to share what they brought to share. And we, we you know, I just accept that and uh, pass no judgment and, and just keep moving forward. So I think, as you said, and Mr. Wagner said, there, there really is a, a collaborative spirit going on right now and one that I want to continue to foster. And, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been good. So again, thank you all and thank you for members, uh, board, you know, committee members and, and staff who have supported us. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help get, get you there. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so item B, consideration of Lake County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee's recommendation to approve $5,400 to support the Robinson Rancheria and California Department of Fish and Wildlife Program to eradicate, eradicate carp from Clear Lake. Thank you. Um, yeah, not, not the word eradicate might, might be a little strong, but to manage the number of carp in Clear Lake. I'm going to give you a, a very brief overview. Uh, Louise can get into the weeds, if you will, on how this project is designed to work. And, and to be clear, uh, even though Luis is one of the principals um, of this project, uh, he did recuse himself from the vote from the, from the committee, and it was a unanimous uh, vote on the part of the committee to advance this to the board for your consideration. And Supervisor Green, I'm not sure if you, you're aware that the Fish and, one of the primary purposes of the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee is to advise the board on how to spend fish and, fish and wildlife fine monies that are collected by the county. Warden writes a ticket, the, ju the, the court uh, levies an award, a portion of that money goes, a portion of that fine money goes into a separate account at the county. The only, and the reason the county can accept that money is because there's a Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee. So one of our jobs is to come back to you and say, well, we've got, we've got some money in this account. Right now it's, and Catherine Vanderwall, your Ag Commissioner, is our administrator. Uh, but uh, we're around $40,000 in the account. Uh, Catherine and I worked annually and we put together a, a budget kind of ballpark figure of about, we allocate about 20,000 or about half of the, the total budget for projects each year. And it's encumbered on each member of the committee to go out and drum up projects, if you will, try and spend that money. That's why we're coming here today with that kind of a thumbnail overview. But just, I know you're, you're the only one that hadn't heard my spiel on that and I wanted to give you that. So uh, we were approached by Robinson Rancheria and uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife to assist them in doing surveillance of tagged, radio tagged carp in Clear Lake to follow them post spawn this time of year to see where they congregate in the lake so that a company that's working with the rancheria and, and the state can come in and harvest carp using, using nets but to efficiently and effectively identify where carp congregate in the winter months so they can, they can increase their, their efficiency. Um, at one point there were 30 fish that were radio tagged, but, uh, mostly carp, a few common goldfish, uh, and Luis and, and his folks drove around the lake trying to find these fish. Well, you can imagine using, using radio telemetry equipment, which I've done in the past, um, it's, it's cumbersome to drive around and try and fish, find a fish in a 44,000 acre lake. The proposal is to um, provide the rancheria and fish and wildlife 
with enough money to do three flights, three flyovers of the lake with radio telemetry equipment to locate these fish and to identify where these fish in the wintertime are, are stockpiling so that this company coming in can, can target these fish and remove them. So three flights at $1,800 a flight for a total of $5,400. Um, with that, I'm going to let Luis tell you why, why there's a, an interest and a need to remove carp the number of carp in the lake, and let him give you some details of the, of the project. It's all yours. <clears throat> yeah, so it's definitely a management uh, program now. It's not eradication. It's probably impossible to eradicate any kind of species from the lake just because how big it is. But um, we tagged 30 carp and goldfish um, January 2022, and so we have an antenna that we could either drive around on our boat or out on the truck around the lake. And so to do the entire lake in like the best of our ability in the truck or vehicle, whatever it may be, it takes two days uh, to go around the whole lake. And then to do it in a boat, it takes a day and a half. But the problem that we ran into this last uh, spring and winter was <clears throat> I lost a bunch of tags and I had no idea where they went. And so I went up to Tule Lake and I found three tags. And then up in Scotts Valley, we found more carp. Um, off of uh, Eikhoff. So the carp were migrating when waters were connected. So then that added more to like trying to find these carp. So what the flights would do was you could do it in less than a day. <clears throat> and we could do it seasonally because it's three flights. So we could pick um, the seasons. But um, removal of carp and goldfish would happen in the winter. Um, and we would stop probably a month before we would think the hitch were um, going to make their runs and spawn just so we don't stress them out. Um, so removal would be like November to January. Um, so we do want to do flights uh, definitely in the winter, uh, possibly in the spring and then in the fall, uh, just so it's better to, it, it'll tell us more of like, okay, this is where we need to focus. Um, what we have seen is near Redbud, there's a lot of carp there. So we know they do congregate there in the winter, and some do congregate in Rodman Rotten, Slough in the winter. But after that, like, we've been trying to find them, and we just cannot find them. So Tell them why you want to get rid of carp. Oh, and so <laughs> the, bi the biggest reason uh, getting rid of carp in the lake itself, um, they eat a lot, and they eat everything. So they do eat fish eggs. So when hitch do spawn in the lake, they'll eat those eggs, carp and goldfish. Um, they're very aggressive. Uh, both species, they will kind of move everything out of the way, including bass and catfish. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons we want to get rid of them, uh, the fish eggs, but they also eat all the food. So all the food that the hitch would be eating, they also eat that. They uproot vegetation, which is the habitat that the hitch would, um, you know, kind of hang out in until it's time to go out into the open lake. Um, so ecologically speaking, they're just bad for hitch. What about water quality? Uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen them spawning, um, typically in March and April, but the lake becomes like black along the shorelines where they're spawning just because their spawning behavior. Um, during their spawn, they kind of kick up sediments, and it could be like a foot deep that they kick up those sediments, and they suspend uh, sediments and, you know, add to the pollution within the lake, uh, which isn't good. Yeah, so the, uh, the spawning activity is, as Luis, they're, they're, they're quite aggressive and uh, kicking up that mud sediments is also going to be releasing phosphorus into the water column, which uh, is a principal driver of cyanobacteria. And so um, the, and the amount of biomass in this lake by carp, there's tens of thousands of carp out there and they're big animals and everybody focuses on the adults, but little carp are going to eat baby fish. And so those little hitch that are coming down and going to the tulies, they're going to be sharing space with carp in those tulies. And uh, um, as Luis said, they're, they're quite aggressive. Um, and uh, the, the data that we, we were shared with is that there's a, there's a level where carp numbers, the amount of biomass pounds per acre, if you will, of carp, 
creates, creates an economic and ecological concern, uh, that level in Clear Lake is about two and a half times what that, that threshold is established at. So the idea is that uh, to remove some carp, and carp were removed for most of the 20th century. There was commercial fishing going on on Clear Lake. And uh, those, those carp were captured in seine nets, uh, along with goldfish and, and Sacramento blackfish, transported live and sold in the markets in uh, San Francisco's Chinatown. Mo but why did that stop? People got old and they retired. The last commercial fishing stopped about 2001. So the, explain the group that you're working with that's uh, going to, and what they plan to do with these fish and how they plan to catch them. Yeah, so it's WSB Engineering out of... Um I think their main office is in Wisconsin, but they also have offices in Minnesota. And out in the Midwest, they do that all the time. They remove carp and goldfish. Um, I think four different species out there. Uh, and so they came out and they're like, hey, we could probably use this technique to kind of remove them. So they showed us how to do the, the seines. And the seines, it's, it's big webbing, it's big um, mesh. So it mostly keeps out all the other fish. Um, and so, you collect the big carp and big goldfish and then you remove them like that. Any kind of bycatch you just kind of throw back in the lake. Um, the other thing they showed us was box netting. And this was, a, I was super skeptical when they told me, but um, you, you put down cracked corn. So stuff you would feed your chickens and you put it in the lake and then the carp come and eat and you kind of have this net sitting on the bottom. And then once you know they're eating it, you lift the net. And so the first one they showed me, it was right around 350 carp and one goldfish and nothing else, which was wow. kind of incredible. I was just like, I didn't believe you guys. Because um, I, I was thinking like, oh, we're gonna catch bass and probably some sunfishes. Um, but yeah, it was all carp. And then any bycatch we did get was um, catfish. So we weren't getting much other bycatch other than catfish. But it was, it was successful um, where we did do it. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, they, they came and showed us, and so the, the, the idea is they're going to come back and show us even more, and then that way we know how to do it, and then moving forward we can manage it ourselves. So given the fact that this group that uh, Robinson Rancheria and Cal Fish and Wildlife are working with have, have experience in this very thing and are willing to come out here, work with local represent, representatives, and, and teach them how to do it, uh, the committee felt that you know the expenditure of five thousand four hundred dollars to kind of <clears throat> jumpstart this and, and to to get that basic information they need where to target where to target these fish was was a, a good a good use of of this money. So we, as I said, unanimously the committee is recommending that uh, this project be be awarded five thousand four hundred dollars out of the Fish and Game Fund to uh, to support this effort. And if you have any questions. Thank you. So any questions from the board? Yeah. Supervisor Green? That budget unit 2701, that is the fine account. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Supervisor Spatier? Yeah, just a quick question. I was hoping that uh, you would provide that, but just the introduction of carp uh, to the lake. <sighs> so carp, there's, there's, <laughs> there's several stories. There's speculation. But uh, carp were suspected of being the the great fish and um, in Europe they're they're highly sought after and in parts of Asia they're highly sought after there's confusion as to are these European carp or Asian carp uh, the the best urban legend is that some carp were brought into Sonoma County in the 1880s and uh, this gentleman took it upon himself to move carp all over and and worked with others to move them around because they would improve the fisheries in California. Today, carp are everywhere. But it, it started, I say, the urban legend is that it may have started from one individual in Sonoma County. What have you heard? Um, fish and game back in the 1920s kind of was just putting fish everywhere. Um, that might have been one thing. But yeah, farmers. That's job security right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they didn't know any better back then. It was crazy. They were introducing northern pike everywhere as well. So, um, yeah, your guess is probably as good as mine. And then uh, the final question is, uh, you spoke about how they're going to get the carp. What are they doing with the carp once they um, manage the carp population? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we've been, I've been reaching out to a lot of different facilities to see if anyone would take them. I've reached out to a couple of vineyards too and 
only one responded, but it was at the wrong time. Um, so what we've done at Robinson is we put some around the garden, um, but anything else that we couldn't really do anything with or no one wanted to take, we buried. Um, what kind of groups are you reaching out to? Uh, so fertilizer facilities. Um, there's one group, I forget what they're called. Actually, there's two groups out of like Fresno that would like to take them. Um, and so if they want to take them, that's fine. Uh, I also reached out to the compost place in Kelseyville, but I, I never got a oh yeah I never got a response. Um, Jackson Family Wineries was interested, but it was the wrong time. They're like, oh, we're not everything we've done with compost we've already done, so I'll reach out in the winter, and so I'll reach out to them again. Okay, thank you. Try the um, there's a soil company I think in Potter Valley. Okay. Um, Old Creek Compost. Yeah, that's how I reached out. They. I know they have chickens in their soil, so maybe they want fish too. <laughs> Any other comments from the board? Nope. Okay, we'll open it up for the public. All right, we've got staff. So no staff no again. time. Um, uh, again, Terry Logson, Chief Climate Resiliency Officer, Tribal Liaison. I'm speaking on behalf of Angela de Palma Dow, uh, who had to leave. She apologizes. But as the Invasive Species Coordinator, she said that she supports carp removal program because, um, as calculated based on Robinson, CDFW, and WSB engineering surveys, the carp in the lake currently are responsible for putting 16,135 kilograms per year of phosphorus in the water column uh, from the sediments, bioturbation. Uh, and so, of course, phosphorus is food for cyanobacteria. And as Chair uh, Juicy mentioned, she, along with the others, all support this. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hey, anyone from the public? Looks like we've got someone coming up. Chris Jennings. Here's a fun fact for everyone. According to the Lake County Record B, they post an article on February 23rd of this year. Carp came to Clear Lake in 1880. And they're the most widely eaten fish in the world, with more than 200,000 tons consumed annually. So maybe we can eat the carp. Thank you. Thank you. Need to start a carp festival. <laughs> well, I, when I lived in San Francisco in the late 90s, everyone was like, oh, yeah, we go up to Clear Lake to fish carp all the time. So is that not a draw anymore? People just aren't doing it anymore? How do we get people to come not, back and not, fish for carp? Well, you got to use corn. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't hear about a lot of people fishing for carp. Okay. Come on up. Well, since they're so big, maybe bow hunting them? I mean, well, there, I there were, there, no, there were uh, bow tournaments, archery tournaments uh, that were quite popular and uh, during the spawn. Uh, they've just kind of gone away. I, I think the organizers just gave up. Uh, but they, they were quite popular for, for a number of years. And I, I see people up here in the spring doing it individually, but it's not organized uh, tournaments like there were uh, uh, 10 years ago. And, but it used to be quite popular. Now it's more on an individual basis. All right. okay, John Moss, I agree with you, Jessica. I know that there are many of the people who are up here with the geothermal development would go to the lake with bows and arrows, and there was one weekend where everybody shot the carp with their bows and arrows. It did happen. Yep. Okay. Anyone else in the chambers? Not seeing anyone, and I don't see anyone in the Zoom room. Um, so I will bring it back to the board for action. Madam Chair, I move to approve the recommendation from the Lake County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Committee for $5,500 to support the Robinson Rancheria and California Department of Fish and Wildlife Program to manage... $5,400. $5,400. Did, did I not say that? I apologize. $5,400. <laughs> I apologize. So, uh, support and, the Robinson Rancheria and to manage the carp from Clear Lake. And Madam Chair, if I may add, um, the approval of the amount is from uh, Budget Unit 2701. As amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hey, thank you, Lise and Greg, for coming in today. And thank you for um, all of your volunteer work on the committee. I know it's a time commitment, 
for all of these committees and really appreciate everything that um, you've been working on since we kind of gave that committee new direction and new life last winter. Thank so you. I really appreciate your work. I will share with you when Angela uh, said the old proceedings from the 1997 symposium is gathering dust. Well, I was one of the principal organizers of that, and I'm gathering dust too, so I, I feel like kindred spirit with that old book. Thank you. Thanks Thank you both.